Hello, everyone. Welcome to the BUC Sciences webinar session. In case you don't know about us yet, I would like to briefly introduce our product line related to today's topic. BUC Sciences, located in Long Island, New York, is a professional chemical provider and currently the largest supplier of pseudoiridine in the world, with the most production capacity of pseudoiridine and its derivatives. Our annual output of pseudoiridine is currently over 500 kilogram. In the past year, our product N1-methyl pseudoiridine has been used as a raw material in the production of mRNA vaccine against COVID-19. We are very proud to support RNA-related research and development with our products. In today's webinar session, we have Dr. Silva Ruskin present her works related to alternative RNA structures. We will learn about the novel techniques developed by Ruskin Lab, which can distinguish multiple RNA conformations formed by the same underlying sequence in vivo at single nucleotide resolution at a high throughput scale. During the pandemic, Ruskin Lab applied the technology to, pro to probe the structure of the entire SARS-CoV-2 genome in vivo. Our speaker today, Dr. Ruskin, expertise in investigating how RNA structure and function impacts viral infections and human disease for the design of novel therapeutic approaches based on targeting RNA. Dr. Ruskin immigrated uh, from Bulgaria to the United States alone as a teenager to pursue a career in science. At her 16, she became a freshman at the Florida Institute of Technology and obtained a bachelor degree in physics. Dr. Ruskin did her PhD in Jonathan Westman Lab at UC uh, SF, follow, followed by a traditional postdoctoral fellowship. In 2015, uh, she started her research independently at the Whitehead uh, Institute for Biomedical Research at MIT. Since last year, September 2021, she became an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School in the Department of Microbiology. So that's all for the introduction. Uh, just keep in mind that you will be able to post your questions related to this webinar content during the presentations uh, and simply just post them using the Q&A panel on the bottom of the screen. Uh, and after uh, the presentation, uh, Dr. Ruskin will answer like, select selectively of the, que uh, of the questions. So uh, yeah, let's welcome Dr. Ruskin. Uh, you can begin, we are ready. Hi everyone, um, thanks for coming. It's, it's hard to see anyone on the Zoom talks, but um, I'm very happy to be here. So let me share my screen and make sure you can see my presentation. Um, can you see it now? I'm assuming yes. Yes, yes, we can oh, see excellent. one. Thank you. Okay, you great. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Just just uh, checking. Great. So um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sylvie. And um, as thank you for the kind introduction, uh, my lab generally works on RNA structure, and we're very excited about RNA therapeutics. And uh, we just moved recently to a Harvard Medical School in the Department of Microbiology. And I'll be telling you about what we've been up to. So I'd like to start with a recent report from the World Health Organization about the deadliest viruses on earth. And here I'm showing you the top nine, which include viruses like Zika, Ebola, Dengue, HIV, influenza, and SARS. And I hope you can appreciate this is a very diverse set of viruses that infect different cell types and cause different disease. But one thing that's common to all of them is that they're all RNA viruses, meaning that they store their genetic material as RNA. And my lab was previously focused on HIV and looking at the shapes it forms in the cell and, and this, their implication for HIV infection. But with the pandemic, I realized that the methods we developed were directly applicable to SARS-CoV-2. And so we, we did a lot of work on this virus with the ultimate goal of identifying small molecules or antisense oligos 
that bind to and inhibit the virus and could represent a novel class of therapeutic strategy. And I'm gonna further explain how this works. So first, why is RNA so special? Just like DNA, RNA consists of a string of nucleotides that store genetic information. But DNA always comes in pairs of two molecules that are bound together in this very rigid double helix shape. On the other hand, uh, uh, RNA is one molecule, but instead of being linear or rigid, it is much more flexible and often folds back on itself to form very complex shapes that are very important, but really hard to predict. So here I'm showing you one example where the RNA molecule starts with this blue sequence and, and this we call uh, stem loop motifs in, in the 2D, which is on the left. And on the right, I'm showing you the 3D structure. And what I hope you can appreciate from this example is, is how complex RNA shapes can be in contrast to DNA. And it turns out that these shapes encode a second layer of regulatory information on top of what is encoded by the linear sequence alone. So RNA can both store genetic information like DNA, and here uh, on the left, I'm showing you the genome of influenza virus, but also RNA can fold into complex shapes like proteins. And this gives RNA some very interesting properties, including the ability to do work, like the ribosomal RNA can actually catalyze reactions. And this is uh, typically a function performed by proteins. But in, in a sense, this makes RNA the most versatile of all the, the biomolecules. So typically people think of drugs targeting, let's say a cellular or in this case, a viral protein to inhibit some important stage in the viral life cycle, such as viral entry or viral replication, viral assembly and so forth. And so the idea is that one develops some small molecule that can specifically fit in and bind to and inhibit some viral protein as shown here on the left. But the issue has been that many proteins, both viral and cellular, are not druggable because they don't have like a nice, good, small molecule binding pocket, like the one illustrated here. And so for a long time, it was thought that RNA is also non-druggable, but the view is now being challenged by multiple scientists and companies. They've been successfully docking small molecules to defined RNA structures, such as the one shown here uh, in the right. And this is from Arrakis Therapeutics. So a, a big break, breakthrough came a few years ago where pharmaceutical giants like Novartis and, and later Roche independently developed uh, similar looking small molecule drugs that can directly bind to RNA for the treatment of spinal muscular atrophy. And this disease is caused by faulty processing of RNA of the SMN2 gene. And so both of these compounds are, are performing really well in phase two trials. In addition, there is a, a different RNA targeting strategy based on antisense oligos or ASOs, and this popular drug called Spinraza, and there've been now seven FDA approved ASOs for the treatment of SMA. So this has been extremely successful and this great example for targeting RNA to, to be able to treat diseases. And so I hope I've convinced you uh, why we care about RNA structure. And really the two main points is that RNA structure is at the heart of all RNA-based regulation and is because RNA structure offers a new therapeutic avenues. And here I'm just showing you the coronavirus um, along with the RNA genome. But... Despite how important RNA structure is, historically, RNA structure has been very difficult to determine because it's limited to pure computational prediction or experimental studies that use short sequences that are arbitrarily cut out of their context and then refolded inside a test tube. And so what my lab has been doing is to overcome this, a lot of these limitations by developing new tools 
to understand the roles of RNA structures in gene expression and disease, as well as how can we leverage these functional structures to design RNA-based drugs. So what's interesting about RNA in contrast to proteins is on a biophysical level. And so in case of proteins, the free energy of folding is often described as a funnel, which means that there is one point of minimal free energy that represents one solution uh, that is optimal for how this protein will fold. This is one very well-defined structure. In contrast, the theoretical RNA folding landscape has multiple wells that the RNA can get trapped into. And these wells can correspond to very different structures that give an RNA with identical sequence, very distinct shapes that could have very distinct per uh, properties. And so the question that was very important to us, so again, I'm showing you this is mostly based on theoretical work or experimental work of some very special RNAs like bacteria or riboswitches. But we wanted to know for, for RNA in general and, and an RNA sequence, do identical sequences form different structures as theoretically predicted? And when we started working on this, there were a lot of really great chemical probing approaches developed by us as well as many others to assay RNA structure in high throughput in cells. However, a big limitation of all these approaches is that at the end, you get some structure that represents a population average. And such average will obscure or blurry signal from alternative structures. So just to illustrate the problem with the average, I'm, I'm gonna give a real world example and state a fact that in 1985, the average starting salary of a geography major graduate from UNC was $130,000. So if we step back and think about this information, uh, it seems a little bit off because the year is only 1985 and someone has just graduated and suddenly they're earning 130K. I mean, it seems really nice, uh, but seems a little bit extreme. Uh, and if we look at the underlying distribution, actually no one was making 130K. And indeed the majority of graduates were, were barely uh, making above 10K. But in this case, there was only one outlier who really shifted the average and made it uh, uninformative and misleading. And so, I'm using this example to illustrate that by analogy for a class of RNA molecules with the same sequence, it's possible that none of them are actually forming the structure that is derived from a population average model. And so these kind of models should always be considered with a grain of salt. So our question was, do the same sequences indeed form multiple different structures. And so what we needed was a single molecule technology. And, and we were interested in the structure of individual molecules instead of a structure of a population average. So we set up to develop that. And our favorite chemical in the lab is called dimethyl sulfate or DMS. And this is because DMS goes into cells quickly and reacts with open and accessible adenine and cytosine bases. And in short, knowing which bases are open and, and, which, are, uh, and which are paired allows us to make good models for how the RNA folds in cells. However, to take this to a single molecule level, we first needed to establish a new experimental procedure and then develop an algorithm to deconvolute this data. So just to prepare you for what's coming, I'll, I'll first walk you through some technical details because it's an important concept for the interpretation of the data. And then I'll show you how we apply these methods to, uh, to discover new biology and to help us develop therapeutics. So we first developed the ability to probe single molecules. And the way this works is by modifying a single RNA at multiple open bases. And then we detect these modifications or this open bases with a special RT enzyme. And what this RT enzyme does is it, as it goes through to make cDNA, every time that it encounters a DMS methylation on the RNA, it incorporates uh, mutation in the cDNA. And so then all we have to do is sequence this uh, single-stranded 
that these DNA molecules, and we know when we see a, a DNA molecule, when it has mutations on it, we know that these mutations came from open bases on a parent RNA molecule. And next we developed an algorithm that uses this chemical probing data to detect RNA folding ensembles with expectation maximization clustering. And I'm going to briefly explain how this works. So imagine you have this RNA sequence and this sequence is forming two very different alternative structures in this case. There'll be some open bases that are exclusive to one structure or the other. And these open bases will react with DMS and then they'll get converted to mutations on, on single molecule reads. And so we end up sequencing these DNA reads that now have co-occurring mutations that are specific for one structure or the other. But what was typically done before this work is to analyze all of these reads together in one bin and get, of course, you get a population average signal. And in this case, it will not correspond to either of the structures that I'm showing here. But what our algorithm did instead is to separate out these sequencing reads based on their mutation pattern into belonging to distinct structures or what we call clusters that have distinct DMS signal that now can be used as constraints to generate accurate models for alternative structures. And for the purpose of this seminar, I'm not going to go into all the experimental and computational detail that went into this work. Uh, it, it's, it's been published, you can go and, and, and read it and please don't hesitate to contact me if you have uh, questions. But the key into this whole work here was, was having some really nice ground truth controls that we could use to test and validate and further develop our both experimental and computational methods. And they performed extremely well. So using this tools, we discovered that actually the HIV RNA, uh, this is a, a short, so RNA viruses are typically very short. In case of HIV, it's only a 10,000 10, nucleotides. This is the whole genome. But what's cool about it is that this sequence of 10,000 nucleotides can actually fold in many different ways. And in some ways, kind of what I'm showing you here, I'm showing you a small uh, fraction of it on the left, it folds in a way such as it exposes a given splice site. So now this splice site you see is open and accessible and can be used by cellular host protein factors can be recognized and splicing will happen in this HIV molecule that's forming this kind of structure. But the same sequence can fold into alternative structure that now occludes this splice site because it's paired up with something else, some sequence upstream, and now cellular factors can no longer recognize and bind to it, and so that would inhibit splicing. And so our work showed that HIV RNA has this intrinsic ability to fold into multiple structures. Therefore, despite having the same sequence, different molecules can occlude different splice sites by forming RNA structures and therefore direct which gene is, is expressed from a given RNA molecule. And in addition, can you imagine an alternative structure that includes all splice sites? And that can guarantee that a fraction of molecules will remain full length and will serve as the HIV genome that will get passed on to the next cell. So therefore there's this role of intrinsic RNA thermodynamics in setting the level of HIV gene expression. And again, this work is published. I uh, encourage you to check it out and, and ask any questions. But uh, I want to just show you how this new tools en enable discovery. And I wanted to go into a little more detail about our work on SARS-CoV-2 and the exciting part of this is because we were so well set up, we actually managed to, to determine the full structure of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, within a month of starting to work on it. And within a few months, discover new biology, such as insights in the mechanism of frame shifting. And within another few months, get this 
amazing collaborators and start developing therapeutics such as the antisense oligos. And I'm gonna touch on upon this, this topics. And just as an introduction, the, the SARS-CoV-2 is another RNA virus, is actually uh, one of the largest RNA viruses. It's three times larger than HIV. You can see it has 30, about 30,000 nucleotides genome, but it's still very small in terms of genome uh, size. And, and I'm gonna describe how we set up to do this. So our initial setup was as follows. We, um, we did we used both uh, vero cells, which was initially the, the only model for uh, replicating SARS-CoV-2 in, in cell culture. Later, we repeated the same experiment in, in human-derived uh, HER7 cells. And the way it works is basically we get the cells uh, and we infect with with a virus, and then we ask what the RNA structure looks like. We DMS modify, so we have a snapshot of what the RNA structure looks like of this virus inside the cells. And of course, uh, then we have to do quite a bit of computation uh, and data analysis to figure out how uh, the RNA is folded. So we're actually the first lab to publish a genome-wide um, a population average structure of SARS-2 and infected cells. And this was back in May, 2020, because coronaviruses were really under study um, and no one had ever done any experiments to see how this, this uh, virus is really folded inside cells. Um, and of course, like every scientific, uh, most scientific endeavors, it took quite a bit longer for this uh, to get finally uh, into in press, but it's now, I'm happy to say in press and major communications. And here I'm just showing you um, our model over the first 5,000 nucleotides. And again, this is with the grain of salt that here we're assuming that every molecule with the same sequence is folding into the same structure. And, and you know, I, I'm not expecting you to get much out of this besides, okay, there is some very interesting, it's not a linear molecule. You can immediately appreciate that. There's a lot of stem loops, there's a lot of bulges, there's a lot of potentially interesting places that one can develop, uh, one can imagine designing some specific uh, molecule binding to it. And what was important to us, of course, was that you know our our um, our methods were recapitulating previous work, uh, which was all focused on the SARS coronavirus five prime UTR because it's extremely conserved in many coronaviruses. Um, and even though it was mostly done in vitro, so almost entirely done in vitro, we, we agreed really well with the work that was done previously um, for this particular region of the first about 500 nucleotides of the virus. And then we went over, we went ahead to ask the same question that we'd asked for HIV. Does this sequence, we have this nice population average model. Well, how good is this model? Is it really just one structure or are there multiple structures? And I'm, again, I'm gonna spare you here all the technical details, but just to show you here, I, I've, I've plotted the, the, the genome sequence the region, so from zero nucleotides to 30,000 nucleotides. And in gray, I have highlighted the regions where our methods is saying that this sequence, particular sequence is coming from, it must be coming from at least two alternative structures or more. And so you can see it's actually uh, kind of curiously the five, the five prime uh, the very beginning of this virus was really forming one stable structure. There was indeed one nice solution. We could not see any alternatives in the structures of the 5 prime UTR. But as soon as you kind of got out of it, there was a lot, there were a lot of sequences, uh, really most, more than half of the genome that were clearly uh, in, in multiple forms. And one, one sequence that kind of immediately caught our attention and the time was the sequence in the middle of the genome called the frame shift stimulating element or FSC that I'm highlighting here um, in red. And so we set out to explore the sequence more. And so just to show you the organization of SARS-CoV-2, uh, 30,000 nucleotide genome, FSC is kind of towards the middle. Um, and this, sequence is really critical 
um, for the virus in order to produce the complete set of proteins that the virus requires. So basically there is one open reading frame on ORF and it's called ORF1A or ORF1B that is kind of uh, defined by the location of this frame shifting element. And here again, I'm showing you the sequence. And what happens is typically the ribosome you know, goes, goes along on a certain open reading frame and it's reading and it's making this protein, but then it reaches a stop codon, uh, UAA in this case. And when it reaches a stop codon within this sequence, obviously it lets go, it makes the protein, it lets go and it stops translating. So it never makes uh, ORF1B product. Uh, but every once in a while, if you have a frame shifting sequence, like you do in the coronaviruses, the ribosomes goes, goes, goes. And then there's this slippery side, this UUU, where the ribosomes just tracks, goes backwards, in this case, by just one nucleotide, but that's sufficient, of course, to entirely change the, the reading frame. And now instead of a stop codon, it reads an amino acid, in this case, it's valine, and it continues to, to make this polyprotein and, and in, uh, make what's encoded in ORF1B, which is absolutely essential because it is, includes the viral RNA polymerase. So it's the only way that this virus can replicate. And so you can appreciate how this event is absolutely critical for the virus. And it is, okay, so it is thought that maintaining the correct frame shifting rate is actually really important for viral value uh, of viability. So you don't, you, there's some optimal ratio of this ORF1A and ORF1AB product such that is optimal for viral fitness. And if we were to interfere with this ratio, then this, uh, then we can cripple the virus. Uh, but what is setting this, this optimal rate of frame shifting? Uh, and, and how does, like, what causes the ribosome to suddenly decide to backtrack? And the model in the field, the, the most prevailing model, uh, based on studying other actually coronaviruses, um, it, it has been that frame shifting is due to kinetic pausing when the ribosome encounters an RNA structure that cannot be unfolded as easily. What happens is it shifts back to relieve mechanical tension. And again, here, I'm gonna spare a lot of uh, details for the purpose of this talk. But based on all the previous literature had really been done with this short sequences uh, of coronaviral elements, uh, either that were, uh, whose structure was determined either through computational prediction or looking in vitro. And it was thought that this 90 nucleotides uh, sequence of the frame shifting element is forming a pseudonaut, the structure called a pseudonaut, uh, and, and indeed, you know, we recapitulated all this previous literature and can see that the pseudonaut that forms in this context of this 90 nucleotides gives you a certain frame shifting rate, about 20%. And initially, that was the, the rate that was thought that SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses frame shift at 20%. But uh, with our work and then with a lot of newer studies now um, that were that were published um, everywhere in, in terms of measuring the actual translation rate of SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses in cells. It turns out that the frame shifting e event happens a lot more frequently than was initially hypothesized. So 50 to 70 percent um, uh, has, has, has been depending on the time, time frame of infection. And we nicely showed that this is dependent on uh, formation of some really interesting structures that we have never seen before uh, and, and actually are, are very rare uh, in the RNA structure field, but they're very long distance interactions for, uh, at about uh, 1.2 uh, kb apart. So just to give you an idea, basically, uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but if if this was the previous model was that we have some little like stem loop kind of like local local structure forming here and interfering with the ribosome. But what we found is actually there's some sequence that is way far away and it's coming back and interacting and actually causing a lot more uh, trouble for the ribosome. Than, than what was previously thought. So um, that was one 
exciting uh, discovery. And again, I'm not going through all the details, but um, just I hope that I had convinced you that new technology drives discovery. Uh, and I told you about the star spec two frame shifting that paper is coming out hopefully very soon. Um, and also about alternative structures regulating gene expression. And similarly, we have uh, some very exciting unpublished data for um, the role of alternative splicing in neurodegenerative disease, including uh, MAPT, isoform balance that I won't have a chance to talk about today, but, but please uh, feel free to reach out and chat if you're interested. So this is great. We see a lot of structures uh, that are interesting, they're alternative, they're doing something for the cell. So next we thought, okay, if we have a, a stem loop structure, and, and you know, this is in, in very close collaboration with, with Anders Nahr uh, lab, who is at Berkeley. Uh, and, and the idea is very simple that, you know, if you have a stem loop structure, you know, or any structure really that is doing something important for the virus in this case, let's say you know, it's binding some protein and helping translation or transcription or, or any of this, um, then, you know, you can disrupt this structure by adding some antisense oligo. So the idea is the antisense oligo will initially bind, kind of use land into some open sequence, but then reach out further and unfold, you know, some of this uh, stem loop. And now you kind of get rid of this and you unfold this critical structure, and then you can cripple the virus because it no longer is, is forming the stem loop that's required to bind essential protein factors. So can this work in principle? Um, so, here, we're looking at whether an ASO disrupted the structure of SARS-CoV-2 RNA. So on the x-axis is the genome position of the RNA, and on the y-axis is the structure similarity of every nucleotide position. This is between two samples. So if the structure at any particular nucleotide between these two samples is the same, then you have a structure similarity of one. And here in this graph, we're looking at how similar is the structure between, between two samples that are biological replicates inside the cell, these samples that were not treated with ASO. And so you see there, the structure is the same, basically. Now, if we um, repeat here, if we repeat the experiment, but now we're looking at, uh, we add the ASO to only to one sample, and we compare it to the other sample, we see this very large dip in similarity where the ASO binds. And now on the right is the one that, and as you can see, uh, basically uh, this is telling us one that where the ASO is binding and how the RNA structure is changing upon the ASO binding. And the questions that we were really interested in um, here is to, to answer is how many viral molecules are actually bound by a given ASO in cells? And how specific is this ASO to the virus? Um, so is it binding just the target or is it binding the target and a bunch of other cellular RNAs and so forth? And what exactly is the ASO doing? Is it just binding? Is it just binding and perturbing the local structure? Or is it binding and perturbing some global structure of the virus? And those are the kind of questions that, that we can now start to answer in a really high throughput way. And again, uh, I'm not gonna show you uh, the hundred ASOs that we tested, I'm just going to show you the one that we ultimately um, set with and, and tested in, in mouse models. But here, first um, looking at some data, looking at uh, similar experiments, but in a different way. So, what, um, uh, so here, uh, basically, we're looking at how similar is the structure of every nucleotide between two samples. And uh, the, the two samples now, uh, one is on the x-axis, the other sample is on the y-axis. And again, in this case, the samples are not treated with ASO. And each nucleotide here is, each dot here is a nucleotide. Uh, 
um, and, and here the samples of biological replicates against you, you see the exact same result um, that the, the two structures are the same. And I specifically color coded the bases that the ASO is supposed, is supposed to bind to. Those bases are in pink. And um, here are some other nucleotides that also you'll see change uh, there in, in orange. But what we did here is basically first, we treated this RNA with antisense oligos, but a small, small amount of antisense oligos. So just for every 10 target RNAs, viral target RNAs, there's only one ASO. And you see in those conditions, we actually don't see any structure change. The, the plot is entirely the same as with replicates. But as we started to add, uh, adding more ASOs, so here is a ratio of, of um, one to two, basically. Um, so half, half of ASO to, to number of RNA molecules. You can see that now this basis, exactly the basis that we're expecting uh, are changing. And those three, because those three are not folding, I'm gonna show you in a little bit. Um, and then as we add more and more ASO, so this is in a, um, in, in a 0.7 uh, ratio of ASO to RNA, you see even greater change. And if we have, you know, one-to-one -one ratio, this is a one-to-one -one ratio of ASO to target, you see even greater change. And if you have an excess of ASO to RNA, so it, presumably under those conditions, every single a site is occupied by ASO, you see this huge change um, in, in the nucleotides that are binding it uh, as, as well as those three and, and some other ones. But based on, I just wanted to show you this really how reproducible this data is uh, both in vitro and in cells. And now uh, this is uh, showing adding those ASO in cells and saying we can really tell how much of, this is again showing just one ASO, ASO number 26. Well, we could tell that this ASO is really binding indeed in cells and we can kind of estimate based on comparing with this in vitro data, we can estimate how many mo viral molecules bound to the ASO um, in cells. So based on this, and again, uh, we, we could see out of say hundreds of ASOs which one is binding the best to its target in cells. And then we have with our collaborators, a lot of uh, functional data to see how is that affecting viral replication. Um, and specifically using this data uh, on the DMS reactivities, we can predict how the structure was changing. So this was the, this is the five prime UTR of SARS-CoV-2 just to, to, um, to tell you the terminology, SL1, SL stands for stem loop. So we're in, in the RNA structure field, we're uh, very creative. We uh, call all, all the stem loops, stem loop one, stem loop two, stem loop three. You, you'll see a lot of that if you read the literature for any RNA. So the first stem loop is gets number one. Um, and here I'm, I've just color coded the DMS reactivity per nucleotide. Uh, and, and so again, this is the control. This is the gold standard structure. We know that this is all forming, but when we add the ASO, what happens is here is now the ASO. We can see this very nicely that the ASO is binding and those, uh, struct, th those uh, bases become entirely unreactive now in blue by our DMS signal and the bases next to it uh, become extremely reactive because the stem loop one is now being unfolded. And the nice thing about the story is the reason why I wanted to show you this particular example is because uh, our collaborators were able to, to take it to mouse models. And we have this beautiful mouse data showing how the ASO works in an animal. So in this experiment, we infect the mouse with SARS-CoV-2 and give the mouse this ASO therapeutic through inhalation uh, once per day. And then we harvest the lungs and we measure the viral titer and uh, the presence of M protein and spike protein. And as you can see, there is a very, very big decrease in all those measurements, including um, viral load, presence of N, presence of spike. Uh, we also stained the lung tissues 
And so that no, so so here you're seeing um, in in no treatment, uh, the the lungs are chock full of this N protein and stained with it. Uh, but if you give the therapeutic, then the lungs are nice and clear. And so it's an example of how uh, an ASO targeting and destroying an RNA structure can be used as a therape therapeutic against SARS-CoV-2 to clear viral infection. And just to, uh, to zoom out more, more generally, because RNA structure is at the heart of all RNA-based regulation, and we have developed these new tools. We really want to understand the widespread roles of RNA structure uh, in gene expression and disease, as well as how we can leverage these functional structures for RNA-based therapeutics. And this is the lab focuses and directions, and, and a very big focus in, is on gene expression of RNA viruses that I told you about. Uh, a different uh, wing is the RNA-based therapeutics, of course, both with respect to RNA viruses, but also with respect to alternative splicing that happen, uh, mis mistakes in which happen actually in many neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and this is a another big focus of the lab. And finally, um, in terms of, we, we've become really excited in this uh, intersection of the immune system, even cancer immunotherapy and, and activating the immune system uh, through RNA structure as well. So uh, many different lab directions that all have to do with uh, being able to uh, predict and you know, really determine the RNA structure and target it for functional consequence and therapeutic consequence. So with this, um, I'd like to really thank the people in my lab who've been doing this work, especially um, Tammy Lan, Matthew Allen, and Gia Wu, who were very heavily involved in the SARS-2 project that's uh, coming out now. Uh, previously, people uh, th these are the people that did all the work on our HIV project, which is Phil Tomashko, Pumita Gupta, and Harish Swinathan. And uh, specifically, I'd like to thank our fantastic collaborators, I highlighted Anders Nahr, who is critical for, of course, um, the SARS-CoV-2 work, as well as the uh, antisense oligotherapeutics. Uh, we've been very lucky to get uh, multiple fundings uh, without which this would have been <laughs> impossible. Um, and yeah, thank you for your attention. And please uh, let me know what uh, kind of questions I can answer. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ruski. I believe all the attendees enjoyed this presentation as much as I did. It's very illustrative and uh, the message is very clearly delivered. Uh, so we do have some questions from the audience. Uh, like before that, uh, some audiences mentioned that uh, they cannot see the primary screen. Uh, it might be because uh, the, the phone is used. Um, so I hope it doesn't apply to a lot of the audiences. and. Uh, yeah, we can start with the questions from Nick. Uh, so he said, uh, you mentioned single cell work at the beginning. Does the RNA assume one confirmation in single cells or do you deal with a population of different confirmations? And if so, how do you deal with this? Yeah, this is a great question. And, and I'm gonna kind of speak towards what we've seen and what my current theory is, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but basically from our results, it doesn't, it, it appears that, and I think that that makes more sense. It, it's not, it's not a cell to cell difference because each cell, depending on the RNA, it's a vi if it's a viral RNA, the cell will produce thousands or hundreds of thousands of copies of, you know, itself of the virus, right? Uh, and most cellular RNAs that are, are expressed at, you know, a hundred to a thousand copies per cell. And what we think is happening, we have evidence for happening is that in a single cell, if you look at a hundred RNA molecules, they will actually be folded differently within a single cell. So it's less of a cell cell. And, and you know, we can speculate uh, where this comes from, but clearly part of it at least is 
the intrinsic thermodynamic ability. And, and part of it was definitely theoretically predicted based on pure thermodynamics. And the, the, the reason is because the rules of RNA folding are actually quite simple. Basically, the, the biggest energetic stability comes from uh, base bearing. And so you, you just want to optimize the number of base pairs. And so you imagine, it, and the base pairs are so simple. It's just A pairing with U and C with G. So if you have a sequence of, let's say, you know, a thousand nucleotides long, there are many different ways that you can fold up this sequence and have equal amount of uh, number of base pairs fo folding. And so, it, it, so theoretically, you can have, you know, uh, let's say a hundred structures, but with our methods, we don't see a hundred structures. That could be because you know, our methods, and I think though the, the reason why that is, is because the rules are a little bit more complicated. We don't know quite enough about the rules, but there's still uh, a lot of different structures and it's maybe like two or 10 at most, depending again on the sequence, the RNA and so forth. But the just to, without trying to uh, veer too much away from your question is um, that it's less, we care less about what's happening per cell because we do think that the major changes are on the are are already happening within a cell, such that a cell does often represent the population of cells. Now, of course, there will be exceptions to that because you, know, you can imagine how in some cells there is some different conditions. Maybe the cell is stressed. Maybe it has a lot of you know different proteins expressed, and that will change the structure in this particular cell. So there are exceptions to that. But I'm saying at the level that we're looking at, this is an assumption we're making. Right now, we don't have a, a way of doing uh, single cell RNA structure sequencing. And of course, it's something that we've thought about, but it's technically quite challenging. OK, uh, uh, we have a few more questions. Um, Dr. Ruskin, you can just like review them, maybe just select do you want me to uh, read it? two or three more. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Like if um, you pick the one. one Javier. Sorry. Is saying you showed the probing of RNA is probably very abundant. Yes. However, is your technique driven sensitive enough to probe for of, of low abundant RNAs? Yes, yes, um, definitely. So that is the one experimental challenge that was very important to me uh, to overcome. And uh, I didn't, I know I, I hinted to our um, splicing uh, work of MAPT. But in that work, we're actually probing uh, nascent RNA structure. So in that sense, it's really low abundance because it exists, the, the we're probing intronic sequences that exist for, for a very short amount of, amount of time. And so, um, yes, it does work for low abundant. And the reason is because it only requires um, specific RT-PCR. So you know how by RT-PCR theoretically you can detect a single molecule that the sensitivity is is very, very high. Um, and you know I, I can talk a lot more about this, but the short answer is is yes, it, it's very well um, it, it works very well in low abundant RNAs, including super low abundant ones. Uh, so I'm gonna move to one more question. How you, how do you differ between the genomic RNA structure from the subgenome? Yeah, of course, that is an issue. And there, uh, depending on how deeply I go into this issue, but the short answer, let me go through a short answer. The short answer is that the, the way the coronavirus genome works is that the first two thirds of the genome can only come from the, um, the full genome. It's really the last one third that has all the subgenomic RNAs. And we are looking at that as a separate problem, basically, to see, and I can go into a lot more detail, but yes, to see how much of the subgenomic RNA differs from this full length genome. And there are some differences 
but again, we, we don't understand yet the functional consequences of that. And I, I wasn't highlighting that. It's an additional complexity in the last one third of the genome that is not easy to deal with, but we could deal with a little bit with RT specific PCR again. Um, Okay, if the RNA can fold in many different ways, how can you be sure that the ASO will catch your target sequence? Or is it possible to treat with, uh, with a pool of many ASOs? Yeah, I mean, great question. Absolutely, I mean, it is possible to treat of, with pool of many ASOs, and it's just a matter of finding the best ones that will give you the least off-target off target effects. Uh, but yes, this is absolutely. Um, could you describe the project on MAPT? I understood you well. You mentioned the string salt of MAPT RNA. Uh, yes, I can. It's basically in, in very short, kind of like one sentence description. What we found is that the structure that fo forms co transcriptionally, so while, you know, when there's an intron present before even splicing has happened. Is, is a huge driver for the splicing of MAPT. So, you know, there's been so much work done on, on this uh, MAPT, and there are a lot of protein binding sites that have been identified. But what we found is that actually, if you stabilize the structure, it doesn't matter. The protein binding, um, the energy of protein binding is, is much, uh, basically, it, it, it's, it's, it controls the splicing much less. Um, so the structure is a, the largest driver of splicing, particularly for MAPT. And um, if you stabilize the structure even a little bit, you can get a very huge difference in how this gene splices. We think that that is probably not specific to MAPT. Uh, and so we're kind of exploring that in a more genome-wide scale, but we haven't, right, this, this project, as we move to the microbiology department of Harvard, so it's, we, we've shifted focus more in, in microbes, like viruses and bacteria, but yes, it's, it's, a, it's a result that was extremely impressive to me and something that we're following up on. And, you know, I can talk more about it, but feel free to email me if there's uh, something particular that you're interested in. Um, this is yeah. a drug. I think we only have time oh. for two or three more questions. So okay. yeah, we can. Uh, uh, you can yeah, I can go to a, a couple more. This is a druggable RNA target and definition strategy you mentioned for SARS-CoV-2, all for by for human. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, mm -hmm. that's exactly. So the, the druggable RNA targeted the definition strategy does apply for human mRNA UTRs. Uh, the key, of course, is knowing that there is, like, first is identifying that there is a structure in the mammalian UTR that is functional, that's helping translation or, you know, doing something, splicing translation, transcription, things like that. But, but it does. Um, I had two questions. Why I appreciate how important the view structures are. Do you think the vitro structures will, will be sufficient to identify lead structures for small molecule inhibitors as interference with structure in the small scale would likely also influence long range interactions. Um, sorry if I, I didn't read this question um, too, too loud, but yes, um, I think the in vitro work is definitely, I mean, whether it's sufficient, I think the in vitro work is very important and I think it's just that when you know about the long, uh, long range interactions, you could, we actually, uh, I mean, I didn't have time to go over this data, but we can entirely recapitulate the structure in vitro also, if we include the sequence that permits the long range, range interaction. So our whole point was, yes, you, you could probably interfere with both the small and the long range if you're just looking at the, the small thing, but you might as well look at the whole thing in vitro as well and um, give yourself better chances for, for drugs that will interfere for sure, the long and the small. Um, have you performed studies with plus one of ribosome? Is it mechanistically quite different? Can you trust your technique to this particular phenomena? Oh, uh, we have not performed studies with plus one. Um, is it mechanistically different? There's not too 
uh, you know, to my knowledge, there's not, I, I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure it is mechanistically different and, and we haven't really looked at it, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk more. Um, and again, I'm sorry if I didn't get into everybody's questions, um, but please, if you're interested, uh, follow up with me. Um, yeah, I could, I could post my email or if you Google me, I think my email should be available, but <laughs> yeah, we can yeah. definitely Google, <laughs> uh, Dr. Skin a lab and can see more research work and she, uh, publish and, uh, follow yeah. up and see what she will publish. Uh, like if you have a Twitter account, uh, I think the audience can follow as yeah, well. Yeah, Twitter uh, account too, yeah. Bruce Kim Lab. But yeah, please <laughs> co contact me. Yeah. I, I'm very responsive over email usually. Yeah, Twitter is like a new uh, science uh, discussion field for uh, also professors true. right now. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, thank you for all for the questions. Sorry that we cannot go through everything. And uh, thank uh, Dr. Ruskin again for this uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, so uh, after the seminar, we will uh, post this um, video, the record uh, to our official website. And uh, if you want, want to recall, and you can just check our website if you're interested. So yeah, that will, that's all for today. And uh, thank you one more time for your attendance. Stay safe. And we look forward to seeing you all next time. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye.